this evening. Um, to, now we're going to be looking at Agatha Christie and crime fiction as a genre. So 100 years ago, um, this year, Agatha Christie published her first novel, The Mysterious Affair at Styles, and introduced us to one of her most famous characters, Poirot. Over her lifetime, she's published 66 detective novels, 14 short story collections, and has become one of the biggest, well, actually, sorry, the biggest selling author of crime fiction, full stop. Um, to explore crime fiction and Christie's work and how it's influenced crime writers, I'm joined by an amazing panel of speakers. So we have Sophie Hanna, who's the best-selling writer of, well, who is a best-selling writer of crime fiction herself. Um, her 2013 novel, The Carrier, won the Crime Crime Thriller of the Year Award. She's also the author of four highly acclaimed Poirot mysteries herself. And um, alongside Sophie, we also have Rachel Housel Hall, um, who's a critically acclaimed author of crime fiction as well, whose work includes the, includes the Detective Eloise Norton series and the Christie inspired They All Fall Down. Fall Down. She serves on the board of directors for the Mystery Writers of America. And joining Rachel and Sophie, we also have Vasim Khan, who is the author of the best-selling and award-winning Baby Ganesh Detective Agency novels, which are set in modern-day India, and they feature a detective named Ashwin Chopra, um, and this, and in homage to Christie, um, the most recent novel in the series is called The Last Victim of the Monsoon Express. So, Sophie, Rachel, and Basim, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I guess the first thing I want to want to really ask you about are your own novels, because you've all done something very different with the, the crime fiction genre. Um, Vasim, you've taken the concept of the Orient Express to India. Um, Rachel, you've taken the spirit of, and then there were none, to modern day LA. And Sophie, you've actually taken on the voice of another author by writing Poirot novels. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your journey into crime fiction and the books that you write. If I start with the theme. Right, so, um, so one of the things that you quickly realize if you're trying to break into crime fiction is that you have to do something different. It is a, the world's most popular genre now, but it's also incredibly crowded. Uh, so for me, because I'd lived in India for a decade, I wanted to write about India. And I personally think, uh, as do many crime authors, that crime fiction is a really good vehicle for exploring social issues. And that's what I do with the baby Ganesh uh, agency series. So you have Chopra, who is in his late 40s, he retires from the Bombay police force, uh, but he also inherits a one-year-old baby elephant at the same time. So the elephant is a metaphor, it's a symbol for India. It allows me to add uh, some subtle humour throughout the series, but what we're doing is we're exploring India as it is. But the inspiration for some of the stories in that, not just um, the last victim of the monsoon express but the uh, another novel in the series called murder at the grand raj hotel uh, which again is a very agatha christie style uh, death in the nile kind of vision where chopra is called in after the murder of a wealthy american at this uh, premier indian hotel based on the real taj hotel in bombay and she do he does what uh, Christie's Poirot would do. He goes around, number of suspects come to the fore, and then we have a big denouement when he gathers everybody together and we find out who, uh, who committed the murder. And for me, the inspiration for that came from my, my younger days because I grew up in Britain. My parents were born in the subcontinent, came to the UK. I was born here. We grew up here. And I remember in, our, in my teens, the only thing that the entire family would watch together was uh, the Poirot adaptation starring David Suchet. And that was quite amazing to me because my father couldn't even speak English very well, but he just loved seeing this very quintessentially English uh, TV show with this English, uh, not English, but uh, the, 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 the setting was English, but the detective well, and with his quirks and his mannerisms, something about that appealed to him. And I think that stayed with me throughout the years so that as I, as I started to write crime fiction, I couldn't help but be influenced by, by Christie. Thank you. That's that's really interesting. It seems to be a running theme, and it was mentioned in the um, the panel discussion earlier about how that ITV Poirot series has been so um, formative for so so many people's experience of experiences of Christie. Rachel, turning to you. So in in America, Christie's just as huge as she is here. Um, how did you how did you come to crime fiction? What was the inspiration behind your stories, and how does Christie play into that? 
Right. I came into Christie pretty late in life, um, growing up, you know, in America and as a Black American, it wasn't, she wasn't much of a force in our world because just, just because uh, my mom did actually, she watched Masterpiece Theater, which was a PBS show, which had lots of adaptations of Christie novels into movies. And so I, I knew about her, but I didn't understand what the big deal was. Um, when my husband and I first started dating, um, he watched, he loved one of his favorite movies was Murder by Death, which is a Neil Simon movie with all the satire of, you know, Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler, Agatha Christie, and these characters. And it was really funny. I'm like, well, who is the little old lady supposed to be? And that's when I went back and discovered Agatha Christie. I was an English American literature major, but we did not read Agatha Christie. We did the usual, you know, English canon that did not include genre writers because ugh, genre writers, they, they don't matter. Um, so after watching Murder by Death, I started kind of digging. It's like, oh, she's kind of cool. I like these stories. And, you know, I read And Then There Were None, and I like that one a lot. And I saw it in different books that I'd read. It's like, oh, that stems from a Christie story. Oh, Murder on the Orient Express. Oh, I've seen that kind of around. Um, and so I thought to myself, you know, I would like to see an African-American woman in this kind of uh, milieu. I wanted to see, you know, something very uniquely American and in Black American in a Christie novel because, you know, Black folks aren't in locked room uh, mysteries. And so I wanted to take my favorite story, which was, and then there were none, and have it be led by an African-American woman in first person and knowing that it's first person and knowing what the story's ending was, it's like, okay, how am I going to do this? And then also take, as Fasim said, social issues and have them em embodied by certain especially very American types of people. So it was a challenge, it was fun. Um, I, I used all of my, you know, what I've learned in my formal education on how to write this book. And, and it turned out cool. I, I had fun writing that ending. <laughs> <laughs> and then so, Sophie, um, how did you come to crime fiction then? Cause you do a lot of different things, but um, crime fiction seems to be the running thread. Yeah, so I became absolutely obsessed with mystery fiction, uh, which is crime fiction, but the thing that I love is the mystery. Uh, and I became obsessed with mysteries as a very, very young child. I was maybe about six or seven, and I discovered Enid Blyton's uh, Secret Seven books. I did read The Famous Five as well, but The Secret Seven were my, my passion. So I read all of those. And it's about, you know, they're all about a gang of kids who solve mysteries before the, the boring, stupid grown-ups who always get it wrong. And I just fell in love with them. And then when I was just getting to the point where I was too old to read Enid Blyton and I, I was about 12, I'd read all of Enid Blyton's mysteries. My dad bought me a copy of The Body in the Library by Agatha Christie. He used to go to lots of secondhand book fairs and he knew I liked mystery. So he saw this copy of Body in the Library, which is an excellent Miss Marple novel. And he just bought it on spec thinking, oh, well, she might like this. And I read it age 12 and thought, this is everything I have been wishing for in my wildest dreams. Because what I'd been hoping for was to find kind of Enid Blyton mysteries for grown-ups, And that was what Agatha Christie seemed to me to be. So between the ages of 12 and 14, I read every word that Agatha had published. And by the time I was 14, I was one of the world's leading experts on Agatha Christie. <laughs> and like, it just set up in my brain the blueprint for what the ideal novel should be and do. And, you know, it, it made me, it just sort of reaffirmed my love of the mystery genre. And ever since then, it has been my absolute favourite thing to read and my absolute favourite thing to write. And I love in particular that combination of 
the frustration of being desperate to know the answer and not knowing the answer, combined with an absolute guarantee that you will know the answer. Because <laughs> in real life, I'm a very curious person. Some might say nosy, but I would not. I would say curious. And very often, if there's a mystery in real life and I'm desperate for the answer, I have to accept that I might never get it. Whereas in crime fiction, you know that you are going to get that moment of satisfaction where you go, now I understand how it all fits together. And that, that's what I most love. Well, that, that links really nicely onto my next question, actually. And um, I remember reading somewhere, probably erroneously, I must confess and hold my hands up to it. But um, I remember reading somewhere that um, Christy sometimes used to leave the, de the decision as to who was the main culprit until the final chapter. Um, so that she could choose the most unlikely person, uh, unlikely character to have committed the crime, whether this is true or not. And um, I'm interested in the way crime writers carve out stories that feel authentic and true. And at the end, readers go, ah, of course, of course it's that person. Um, I, I wonder if you could um, perhaps tell me a little bit about that and your techniques for doing it. If we start with Rachel, um, I like earning every twist I, I, I give a reader and I like planting the seeds very early on. I want to tell you basically who did it, but with this hand say she did it, but with this hand do all kinds of crazy things like magic. I want to, when you get to that end, I can say, well, I told you in chapter two who it was. You just didn't, you know, you didn't pay attention or you were, were so excited to plow ahead. Um, I like um, when a reader gets to the end, there's some sort of satisfaction that only if I had only paid it more attention or thought more about that over there, I would have solved it. I don't want it to be very, I don't want it to be a, a Scooby-Doo reveal. You guys know Scooby-Doo, right? Yes, yes. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I want it to be like this fully formed and uh, very honest uh, reveal. Uh, and that takes time. That takes draft after draft for me, planting seeds in every chapter about who this is. And we were talking earlier about first drafts. And how I hate first drafts because I myself, I don't know what's going to happen. Even if I have an outline, we all know that ideas sink sometimes outside of that idea of, of, of what you have. And it's around the third draft where I am totally convinced of who done it. And then I get to go back and make sure that it's, it, it's um, evident in every chapter I write. That's interesting. And Sophie, do you have a similar approach or do you, do you differ in how you carve out a story? Well, I, I would not like to wait till the last chapter to, to decide who did it, because I, I, I mean, I agree with, with uh, Rachel. I think we as writers are better able to cleverly misdirect the reader and plant the clues and yet, and write things so that we know that the reader will interpret it in this way, but we really know that it means that. All of that sort of setting up, setting the stage to make the revelation when it's time can only really be done if you, the writer, know exactly what's going on from the start. Now, that's not true if you are willing to do endless rewriting. So I could imagine going a lot, but you see, I couldn't actually, because I wouldn't know, I wouldn't know how to write chapter one or chapter two or chapter three if I didn't know what story those chapters were part of. So I have huge admiration for crime writers who can start writing their crime novels not knowing any of the plot beyond what they're writing in that moment. I have huge admiration for, for all the many writers who say they do that and pull it off admirably. But personally, I like to know everything so that I can then decide how to portray things and reveal things and misdirect. And I can't imagine being able to do that without knowing up front. Um, yeah. And Vasine, um, how, how about you? Did, where do you fall in this? Um... Well, I'm, I'm going to act as a tiebreaker here and I, I'm going <laughs> to fall on Sophie's side of the, of the fence. And I'm going to go back to something she said a couple of minutes ago, which is 
the mystery element of crime fiction, because I think more than anything else, the kind of crime fiction that I write is about the mystery element. Uh, and at the other spectrum of crime fiction, you have fast paced adventure thrillers uh, where the mystery is less. It's much more about the, the, the action and, and all, of that, all of those kind of things. So for me, it's the intellectual challenge that you're giving to uh, a reader uh, so that in tandem with you, they go through the plot and they solve this mystery, hopefully. And if not, they at least get that great payoff at the end where they scratch their head and say, oh God, I missed that clue and otherwise I would have solved it. And to do that, in my opinion, and certainly the way that I work is to start with the crime usually a murder. And then I ask myself the four main questions, how, what, why, and when, when did this happen? Why, what, would, what is the motivation for this person dying? Um, how, how was the murder committed, et cetera, et cetera. Once you know all of those things, that's when you can go back backwards, or at least the way that I do it, I would then go backwards and start thinking, right now, who else can I justifiably put as a red herring here? What clues can I put to point to somebody other than the person that I know who did this? And then I go back and say, now, how can I make these clues interesting? How can I make them an intellectual puzzle for, for the readers uh, to follow? And Sophie's been brilliant at doing that with her new, uh, new Poirot Mysteries. I think the first one started with three, uh, was it earrings that you, that you put into people's mouths? That, um, cufflinks. Cuff, cufflinks that were put into people's mouths. Now that kind of small clue, that's an intellectual challenge because it immediately asks the reader to ask themselves, why in the world would a murderer leave these cufflinks in these three dead bodies' mouths? So that for me is the way that I, I would approach this, going backwards and then making it intellectually stimulating. Okay, I wonder, I'm, I'm getting the impression here from all three of you as well that there must be some kind of little buzz that you get as authors that you can't share with anyone at the time when you've created a really great red herring and you know it, <laughs> but you have to keep it to yourself. And I was going to ask you about your favourite ones, but I can't, of course, <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> um, the, next, the next question I had, um, which I think is a key attribute to most crime fiction is the central character, whether they're a, you know, a police detective or they're someone working on the outside, kind of looking at a case um, happening elsewhere. So I'm interested to know about the key attributes of the crime fiction detective or sleuth, if you like. Um, Sophie, I think I'll start with you because you because I also want to push you a little bit on the question I asked you before. Um, with regards to writing using someone else's voice. So if, if you could tell me about Poirot and um, how, how you came to um, channel Christie in your writing. Yeah, well, first of all, to, in terms of what you just said about the, the characteristics a detective should have, I don't think there is a set of characteristics. I think, you know, as long as your detective character is doing whatever you want him to do or her to do successfully, you know, Poirot is a very flamboyant detective, but, um, you know, Ruth Rendell's inspector, Reg Wexford, he's not so flamboyant. He's more a sort of good, responsible, ordinary, ordinary man. Inspector Morse is very sort of bad tempered and he likes his opera. So like, I don't think there's, one set of characteristics that detectives in fiction should have. Um, I tend to particularly like, especially now in contemporary crime writing, detectives where I think this is an unusual, you know, this is just a person that I haven't met before who happens to be a detective, rather than here's a, an author who sat down and thought, I'll create a detective and given them all the characteristics that they think detectives should have, because that leads to very hackneyed and unoriginal writing. In terms of Poirot, um, I am not in any way trying to write in Agatha Christie's voice or to channel her voice. In fact, one thing I was clear about right from the start is that I don't believe one writer can or should try to mimic the writing voice or style, the writing voice or the prose style of another writer. I don't think it can ever work. I think your, your voice and your style as a writer, it's like your fingerprint, it's completely unique. Um, so I was very clear from the start that I am not writing new Agatha Christie novels, and I am certainly not writing as Agatha Christie or in her voice. All I'm doing 
is, I mean, I'm certainly writing Agatha Christie brand novels, but that's very different from writing Christie novels. So what I'm doing is writing new novels in which Agatha's detective Hercule Poirot is the star attraction. Um, and I saw my job as basically to be creating new and challenging and brilliant and exciting mysteries that Poirot, that Agatha Christie's Poirot could then solve. And so the way I got around the voice thing, because I didn't want people to think this is someone trying to write a Christie novel in yeah. Christie's voice and getting it wrong. So what I decided to do was create a new narrator and sidekick for Poirot, Inspector Edward Catchpool. So he is the narrator of all four of my Poirot novels so far. And he's also working with Poirot on all these murder mysteries. And that to me seemed like a brilliant way to deal with the fact that it was a new voice and a new person writing about Poirot. Because if anyone reads my Poirots and thinks, these don't seem exactly like Christie Poirots in their tone, there's a sensible reason for that within the framework of the book, which is this is a new person talking about, writing about and working with Poirot. Thank you. It's really that's a really interesting, interesting approach there, because, as you say, there have been some authors that have that have done exactly what you said you, you were guarded against doing. Um, and yeah, it, it, it often works. It often doesn't. And um, that um, and mo moving on to your um, central character, what what was the reasoning behind him and what were your you know, could you tell me a little bit about the attributes you wanted to give to him or that? came about organically? Well, I, I, I can sum up what I think uh, a crime fiction character a protagonist needs to have with one word, uh, and that is likability. And that's, if you, if you want people to read a series and continue to read the series. Now, we have to be careful what we mean by likability. What I don't mean is someone lovable and warm and cuddly. Um, that's not what I mean at all. What I mean is, say you take the case of Burrow, for example. Now, on the face of it, he's not a likable person. You know, he's quite superior minded uh, and he's quite curt and abrupt and he's got these quirks and mannerisms. But if you read, if you read enough Poro, you do fall in love with him and he becomes likable to you. And I think there's a lot of characters that um, can be a lot of different character attributes that can be fit underneath uh, that's that overriding characteristic of likability. So for me, Inspector Chopra, he is likable by the fact that he is an honest man in a very corrupt environment. And everybody knows that the Indian police service uh, has a reputation for dishonesty and bribery and corruption and the rest of it. So he stands as a, as a character who's different to that. He doesn't take bribes. He doesn't believe in the kind of things that people get away with in that society in which he operates. And that in itself gives him this inherent property of likability. But there's other things that small things like taking in this one-year-old baby elephant, even though he lives on the 15th floor of a tower block. Um, why would you do that? You can easily send him somewhere else, but his inherent goodness prevents him from doing that. So these kind of things, I think, under that banner of likability are the single most important attribute, uh, but likability defined as a way of creating a character that people want to spend more time with. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. And um, I, I just love that you have an elephant as a sidekick in your novels. That's just like the most unique thing ever. Um, <laughs> Rachel, so, so your your long running series are um, your Eloise Norton novels. Um, could you tell me about what, what you think about the a central crime fiction um, character and how that plays into the characterization of um, Lou Norton? Yes. Um... I wanted, and I'm always interested in and committed to writing these fully realized people. And that means that they are not perfect. Um, they have blind spots. They uh, are interesting. They have bad habits. I want them all to be, you know, just like us. I really want them to be just like us because I don't want them to... I, I want every reader to see themselves in some part of a character. For Lou Norton, you know, she's strong and brave and she will take a bullet for anyone because that's who she is as a, as a detective. But she's also um, someone's daughter and she's someone's sister and she has 
marriage problems. And, you know, she is jaded about many things that are LA and even with the LAPD who she works for. So she still, you know, there are nicks in her. And with those nicks, you get to play, you get to have these, your, your characters have these conversations where everyone's kind of bringing in their baggage, but sometimes they're too polite to call people out on their baggage. Um, I want them to be complex, but relatable. And it was fun, you know, writing Lou Norton because I didn't know how she'd react to certain cases that I give, you know, the first being a young girl found in a condo hanging dead. She reacted different in that case than what she did in the last book where it was dealing with, you know, big mega rich churches and hoarding and gentrification. So through her, I got to, of course, you know, just talk about some social issues, which we talked about earlier, as well as figure out who this woman is and how the people around her would react uh, to her. Um, for they all fall down. It's interesting, Sophie was talking about not, she's not writing as Agatha Christie, she's writing, you know, something inspired by. And it's been interesting for me because, you know, there have been some readers who are like, well, that's not an Agatha Christie book. And it's like, I never said I was writing as Agatha Christie. It's it's inspired by it, but there's no way I could, as a you know, a black woman in Los Angeles, California, would ever want to write as Agatha Christie. And you know, Miriam is not the typical Agatha Christie character in the first place. She's a woman of a certain age. She's divorced. She's um, kind of petty and 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 funny in that way. And some you talk about likability. Some people may not like her because she's. I would see her on the Real Housewives of Los Angeles type of show. She's, you know, a character, but we all have that one friend who can be totally inappropriate sometimes, but they're great at cocktail hour, you know, and Miriam's that type. And whether you like that or not, that's, you know, a subjective thing, but she's honest. Um, she loves her daughter. She can't understand why she's on an island, even though some of us, would like to put a lot of people on islands and send them away. But, you know, she's, again, she's a very uniquely American character and an African-American character who, you know, I have her and six other people put through the ringer, Agatha Christie style. And, you know, it was a blast doing that, taking something again, very English and turning it into some crazy Americans on a Mexican island somewhere. <laughs> it's great. It's great. It's really, really, um, I mean, all of your books are, are, are fantastic and um, really enjoyable reads. Um, I want to move on to the idea of the who done it or the why done it or the how done it. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to read a quote from Poirot here. Um, he says in one of <clears throat> pardon me he says in one of one of the books, every one of you in this room is concealing something from me. So it seems to me um, it seems to me that the the crime fiction is as much about secrets as it is solving a mystery and how those secrets reveal the um, maybe not very nice character, um, well, the, the darker side of characters and um, beneath the facade. So alongside, you know, you're finding out who, who committed the crime, who committed the murder, the rest of it. You're also finding out things about characters that aren't related necessarily directly to the crime as well. I'm interested in, this idea of a whodunit and secrets as well, and how they play into each other. And Rachel, I wonder if you could if you could um, speak on that a little bit as a as a theme of crime fiction. All every story I write, everyone has a secret, and I love it because, as you just said, it may not relate to the crime, but it colors every answer you give someone. Like right now, you know, you have no idea what I'm hiding back here in my hair. Like, like there's a, a, a safety pin on my shirt or something like that. And I'm very aware of it, but you may not know, but I won't turn like this because you may see it. And I want every one of my characters to have that little thing they're holding back. And so they're either scared of it being revealed or they'd be embarrassed. It may not be a life-threatening one, but again, it colors every interaction you have with someone else. And I think for crime fiction authors, we need those secrets, just one, to help us figure out who these characters are, even if they're on the, on the page for a minute. It also drives the narrative of 
red, the red herring. It's like, oh, I can tell she's kind of not answering 100%. Maybe she could have done it. And as a writer, that makes me excited. That's like my third draft when I get to do that kind of art where you're, you're shaving things and, and making little divots in people. And, but yeah, everybody has to have a secret even if it's, I have a poppy seed in the, my back molar and you can't see it, but I kind of taste it and <laughs> it's driving me crazy. And so I just want to end this interview because I want to dig in my tooth to get the seed out. So yeah, those, I love secrets. Please, please stay with us. Please, please don't end the interview. It's fine. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's great. And um, Vaseem, how about, how about you? How, how do secrets play into to your writing and, and crime fiction from your point of view? I, th I think uh, secrets are a, a, a part of the human condition. All of us have secrets and usually they're very minor secrets, you know, some, some white fib that we may have told our partner or, or our kids or, or whoever, our colleagues at work. What crime fiction does, I think, is take a magnifying glass and exaggerate those secrets to the point that they become toxic and malicious and give the reader the impression once they discover these secrets, that this person could have been capable of, of murder. And I think throughout, if you're going to write crime fiction, then you have to really find out which secrets can be exaggerated in that way and still retain some sense of, uh, you know, possibility or, or realism. Uh, sometimes I'll read a, cri a crime fiction novel and there'll be a twist which reveals a secret. And I just want to throw the book at the wall because it makes no sense whatsoever. It's just totally, totally beyond the pale. But the very best crime novels manage to do to reveal those secrets in in a, in a way that seems seems completely realistic to us. And to, and the other thing to note is that you have secrets which are at a very personal level, but also you have secrets that can be um, told uh, at a, at a higher level. So, for instance, the, I'm writing a second series now set in 1950 in India, and it introduces India's first female detective. Uh, the first book is called Midnight at Malabar House. And Persis, the detective, while she's, inve she's investigating the murder of a senior British diplomat, uh, because a lot of Brits were still living in, in Bombay after independence. And this man is, t is uh, fated by the Indian government. But as she investigates, she begins to find not only secrets that are personal to him and his lifestyle, but also secrets pertaining to the work that he was doing at a higher level for the Indian government. Now, the way that you reveal and entwine those secrets leads to the, the, the mystery element that Sophie was talking about earlier, trying to keep that intellectual interest and challenge going for the, uh, for the reader right till the very end when you hopefully have this big reveal. That's, that's interesting. I think uh, you're right. We, we do all in real life have secrets, but it's, it's um, how those secrets kind of, you know, if we were thrust into a crime drama of our own, how, how would those secrets affect our, our outcome? <laughs> But Sophie, how, how about you and how, how, how do secrets and um, lies, I suppose, as well, play into the, the crime fiction genre from your point of view? Well, I mean, secrets are absolutely essential because if nobody felt the need to be secretive about anything, then every murder mystery would be very short. <laughs> the detective would arrive and say, who murdered this dead body? And the murderer would go, it was me. Let me explain why. I always think I'd be a terrible murderer because I'm very indiscreet. If I've done whatever I've done, you know, whether it's something nice or a murder, I always want to tell everyone about it. So um, one of the things that I think, you know, those of us who are really familiar with the genre, you start to see all these potentials for parodying the genre. And one of them that I've often thought would be hilarious to do as a parody is to write a murder mystery where nobody's keeping any secrets. Everyone's just very honest, very open. And so the detective arrives and they all go, sit down, we will tell you everything that they just do. Um, but yeah, I mean, secrets are, are, you know, the driving force of crime fiction. In fact, crime fiction is much more about secrets than it is about crime. Because so much of the genre, you know, if you were interested, let's say you were interested in, in crime fiction from a criminology point of view, there'd be whole swathes of crime fiction where you wouldn't learn that much about actual crime because um, more crime writers are interested in psychological stress and human relationships and mystery and secrets and all of that good stuff. 
And I think for a lot of us, certainly for me, the crime part is the part I'm least interested in. If I could find a way to make it high stakes enough that people would be desperate to find out without writing about murder, then I probably would, because I'm not actually <laughs> that interested in murder in and of itself. And one of the things I, I do in all my books is I always think, OK, somebody needs to die. That's clear. I'm not particularly interested in murdering them in an interesting way. So you will notice that a lot of my murder victims are very boringly killed. They're either stabbed or shot, whatever gets them dead most efficiently and involves me in the least research about crime. And then I have more time and space to focus on what I'm really interested in, which is what do people want other people never to know about them? And what aspects of our, because the thing about secrets is, Yes, it is all about what we don't want other people to know. But when we don't want someone else to know something about us, it's because we don't want to know that about ourselves. It's like our own sense of psychological survival is only possible if we kind of pretend we're not the real us, but some better version. And that pretense can't happen anymore once everyone knows that you've killed the butler and hidden his body in the coal shed you know so yeah I think secrets are absolutely fundamental to crime fiction well I, I love I love how you said about um wanting to write a novel where everybody just can't help but tell the truth I think that would be fantastic and um, and it leads me on in a way I suppose to the challenges of writing crime fiction and by challenges I mean I mean in a twofold way um it's a it's a genre that has a a very rich history with some very, especially in the, in the English language, some very well-known, you know, big beasts of the genre in terms of the writers and also the characters you alluded to in Inspector Morse before, but then also, you know, I, I probably get um, um, a lot of aggro here, but I believe um, it, it began with the Moonstone and Wilkie Collins, although I think there've been a few short stories beforehand. And then obviously Arthur Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes. Um, what, because of this huge legacy, what challenges are the writing uh, crime fiction nowadays? And on top of that, what are your pet hates? And Vaseem, I'm, I'm going to go to you first for that one. Well, I work in uh, in a in a crime uh, research uh, center. So the biggest challenge uh, nowadays is, of course, the level of technology that we have available to solve crimes. Uh, it's very difficult if you're going to set your your crimes in a very modern environment to avoid the fact that, say, London, for instance, is the most uh, CCTV surveilled mm -hmm. uh, city on earth. Um, so it's very difficult to say that nobody saw anything because it's uh, it's, uh, it's usually captured on camera somewhere and DNA analysis, all of these other tools that we have now and increasingly artificial intelligence and the way that draws together links between various clues and bits of evidence and networks of criminals means that it really is a lot more difficult for you to portray a plot when where the, 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 the people who are investigating it know absolutely nothing and then have to do all of the, the the shoe leather and the in interrogations, etc. But for me, I think that's um, that's one of the the beauties of, of or the challenges of trying to write really good crime fiction because what you do is you put yourself back in your readers' uh, point of view. Do readers really want a long, you know, essay on the the on CCTV or the brilliant new techniques that are out there, or do they really just want a character, characters that they can spend time with, a really good mystery, fully realized characters, uh, as we heard earlier. And do they then want to be able to revisit those characters, particularly if you're writing a series, revisit you as an author, because they trust you. They trust that you're going to deliver a good story that occupies their time in a meaningful way. And as far as bugbears are concerned with uh, crime fiction, I think I hinted at it earlier, and that's the, the industry, and I understand why they do this, because it's marketing, it's advertising, but, you know, you end up seeing 30 or 40 books a year advertised as the greatest twist that you have ever come across, the unanticipated, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the most shocking thing that you've ever seen. And that's fine. I understand why it's done, but it's usually not true. Usually you can see the twist coming. Usually it's, it's far from shocking or unanticipated, but... What's great about crime fiction is that occasionally you will come across 
a fantastic book where you could not see it coming and that floors you and then you just cannot help but start talking uh, about that book to everybody and saying you must read this fantastic crime novel I've just come across. Thank you. And, and Rachel, I'll, I'll move on to you, but just um, Rachel and Sophie with the caveat that we are getting close to the end of um, our time now. But um, what, what do you, Rachel, what are your um, pet hates and also what are you, the challenges that you think the genre faces? The challenge right now, um, especially in America, is inclusivity. I mean, in this, crime fiction tends to be very white, very male. And we're now changing that because you know, black folks are more than just criminals in, in the world. So making this genre more criminal, I mean, uh, more, more inclusive. And fortunately with so many stories to tell, we can go back and tell those stories, but from different perspectives. Um, the biggest challenge right now is how we're portraying police. Police, especially in America, have always been the heroes. And we know now that they have some issues and how are we gonna reflect um, not just dishonest cops, but cowardly cops, um, uh, cops who have who are not altogether upstanding and honorable. And how are we going to reflect that now in in our writing? Because we now know that they do cheat and they do steal and they are dishonest. So that's going to be interesting in how you know this pandemic is going to play out in crime fiction. That'll be interesting too, as people are trapped in homes where you know, there are abusive spouses and abusive parents. And how is that going to reflect in you know, society? And then of course, in literature. Uh, yeah, but I think it's, it's interesting thinking about the, the pandemic side, side of things and the next generation of writers and their influence. And yeah. um, Sophie, how, how about you? What are the challenges that you think the genre faces? Um, I think the challenge, the, the overwhelming challenge the genre faces as probably the most popular fictional genre is to keep coming up with ways to be new and unique and write crime novels where readers will read it and go, even though I've read a million crime novels, this is completely fresh and unique, which links to one of my bugbears, which is lack of originality. I read so many crime novels where I'm like, oh, this kind of thing again, which I'm not keen on. My other bugbear, which I'm actually quite fond of, and it's given me an idea for one of my other parody ideas. So for ages, it seemed that every crime novel I read started with a phone call from a person from the past. So protagonist in the present would be having a lovely time, you know, opening the fridge and getting out some orange juice, 2.4 kids and a lovely husband the phone rings and they pick up the phone feeling very jolly and say hello and someone on the other end of the line goes hello and it's the person from the past with whom you committed a murder 20 years ago. <laughs> and for ages every novel I read started like that and I had the burning desire to write a, a sort of satire of that subgenre where when the person from the past says hello in an ominous and threatening way the protagonist in the present goes, oh, hi, it's you. Hey, remember that murder we committed? Look, I've been telling my husband all about it. You must come over for dinner so that we can all discuss <laughs> the murder. We which would totally take the wind out of the sails of the person from the past. <laughs> so that was one of my bugbears for a while, but I, I haven't come across as many of those person from the past novels recently. <laughs> I absolutely love that. That's great. You have to do your parody parody novels. Um, one final question, and it has to be, I'm afraid, a really quick answer. So if you could give the title and a sentence, why? Um, your favourite Christie novel and why? Um, Sophie, I'll start with you. I'm going to go for Murder on the Orient Express because I believe it has the cleverest misleading the reader and then solution in all of crime fiction. And Vasim? Uh, it's a short story that she wrote, The Adventure of the Egyptian Tomb, and I think it was filmed with David Suchet. And I love that because Poirot gets to go to Egypt and fool around with the tombs, and I have a huge love for Egyptology. So. And Rachel? And then there were none. People on an island, very creative ways of killing them, and then that ending, oh my God, that ending. Vasim, Sophie, Rachel, thank you ever so much for your time. Thank it's been you. a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you for joining us from wherever you may be for this evening's event. We hope that it's deepened your enjoyment and appreciation of Agatha Christie. It certainly has for us. Please do let us know what you thought of tonight's event by visiting the feedback form by clicking the tab at your top of the page. And we hope to see you again soon in person or if not online. Thank you.